This is Bloomberg Equality. I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Romain Bostic. Every Thursday through the month of June, we're broadening our coverage of markets and the economy to take an all-inclusive look at what social equity and equality truly mean for corporations, for investors, and ultimately for our collective global prosperity. We'll go deep into several key topics, including fair access to capital, the imbalance of environmental policies, the divisive politics around gender identity, and whether the rise of AI will narrow our social gaps or create even wider disparities. Today, we start with Pride, a time celebrated annually to honor the struggle for LGBTQ plus rights. Over the next 30 minutes, we will dive into the shift being felt for these communities. So far this year in the United States, lawmakers have introduced more than 400 bills that affect LGBTQ plus rights and companies that have been caught in the fray. One of the biggest examples, the boycott of Bud Light. Now, earlier this year, Anheuser-Busch partnered with influencer Dylan Mulvaney, who garnered fame chronicling their transition into a transgender woman. In a video posted on Instagram, Mulvaney showed of a custom can made with a photo on it. The video then came under fire from those politicians and some consumers, prompting, well, an apology from the beer maker. In an even more recent example, Target removed some items from its collection for Pride Month. The retailer saying a rash of threats made workers feel unsafe. This all leads to a key question for corporate America, how to handle inclusion goals in an increasingly polarized landscape. And ultimately, this all comes down, remain to a moment that corporate America has to stand by either its inclusion goals or mm -hmm. its profitability goals. Which stakeholders are they going to rank first? And sometimes those goals are actually one and the same, to be sure, as well. We talk about this delicate balancing act that a lot of corporations have to do. There was an interesting survey actually done uh, by the uh, Association of uh, National Advertisers that really sort of dived into this idea of why companies have moved down this road here. And some of the concerns that they have, the survey really talked about this idea that they really do want to move deeper into that space to be more inclusive. But as you can see in the chart behind me, about half of those folks who responded, they're worried that they could get it wrong. Not just offending those people who may be against it, but even offending those people that they're trying to woo. There's also the issue here of leadership support and as well as the issue of whether it actually fits the overall corporate branding strategy. But then you take a look at this net chart behind me here and you get a better sense here of the potential benefits to those companies. Of course, it's not just about inclusion as well, but it's about the perception, how people perceive your brand, how people perceive your company here, and of, all, of course, also the issue of loyalty. Of course, when you sort of uh, cater to these folks and you bring them something that is really in their wheelhouse, in their backyard, they're much more likely, Caroline, to stick with that brand over the long haul. Let's dive into this even more. We're pleased to welcome Sarah Kate Ellis, CEO of the largest LGBTQ media advocacy organization. It's, of course, glad. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. The reaction, the backlash that we've seen this year ahead of Pride, how have you seen companies ultimately take a stance or not? Because I know that you're speaking out and wanting Target to change their tune, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think a couple of things are at play here. I don't think this is an overall backlash against the community. I think this is a coordinated minority with a loud voice who are extremists. And their positions are violent and they're using violence to intimidate corporations and people. So I think that we have to be really clear about what the backlash is. Secondly, I do agree, and you mentioned earlier, that there is no difference between your values and your profit, actually. They kind of merge at this point because especially younger consumers, your values equal profit to mm. them, right? So they're driven by who you are. I think, yes, there is a moment right now that we're in where your values are being called into question. Target has been doing Pride for 10 plus years right. at least, has had apparel lines, many, many different collaborations. Yeah. And this year is no different than the past years. The only difference is, is that there's a small coordinated well, group. Well, I'm curious as to why you think that has arisen. The idea that Target has been doing this, even with the Bud Light controversy, there were so many folks uh, from the LGBTQ community saying that, look, every bar they've gone into uh, over the last couple of decades has had a Bud Light sign with the rainbow flag or, or something similar on it. Why now? Why is there a pushback now? Um, I, 
because there is a small group. I mm. mean, they've said it online that they're, they want to make pride toxic and mm. dangerous for the LGBTQ community. And I think what happened with Bud Light and with Target is that they were caught off mm. guard yeah. and they reacted too quickly and didn't really think it through. Because not only do you get LGBTQ consumers, but you get this ripple effect of our allies. And our allies are fierce and our allies are the majority in America. Mm. Um, and 70% of Americans say that if they see a company advertising for, including LGBTQ, it makes them feel better about the company, more apt to buy from the company. Mm -hmm. It's all these positive feelings. And so I think they moved too quickly yeah. and they didn't think it through. That's what's interesting is at this moment that feels more combative. Actually, the acceptance rates are going up according to your data. And I just wanted to, talking of acceptance, of course, one, he's outwardly a gay CEO that I was speaking to, who, of course, is the CEO of Macy's earlier. It happens to be their, their earnings today. So I was on the phone with Jeff Gannett and asking him about their stance on Pride. And he was saying, look, when I look at Pride, I'm quite excited on where we have been and where we are right now. At the end of the day, our values guide us. He was saying and reiterating that you have to be guided by your principles, have to stick by them. You cannot be moved by, as you say, what seems to be a very loud, but ultimately potentially quite small voice that's happening online. And to that point, when you're thinking about companies' commitments, how much do you think corporate America has the power mm. to shift some of the sentiment has the power to put more adverts behind it and educate ultimately the population. Well, if you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, it actually tells you that companies have an outsized presence, especially in employees and other folks' lives, that we look more to company CEOs than we look to our government for leadership. And so I think they have a huge opportunity to help move the needle on acceptance and equality in this country. And that's why they're in the center of this, right? Mm -hmm. So employees say that they trust their employers more than they trust often the government. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives them the opportunity. Not only that, but they have platforms, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And they have economic power yeah. to make moves. That's why you saw the whole Disney blow up, well, I, right? I'm curious that when I see a survey like this, 53% expect the CEOs to shape that conversation here. You're comfortable with that? Because some would say, well, CEOs, I mean, you know, they come and go. At the end of the day, is the ethos that one CEO has, is that going to translate into whoever his or her successor might be? I think, you know, I think it really ranges. I think the CEO is the company, so the company's values are ba are going to be brought to life through the CEO. Mm -hmm. And I think they're one and of the same. And so it's baked into a company then at that point and goes beyond just the CEO. All right, uh, Sarah Kate, always uh, great to talk to you and always wonderful to see you. Sarah Kate Ellis, she's the CEO of GLAAD. We continue our coverage here uh, with uh, our Bloomberg Equality. And the month of June has become a time for brands, of course, to go all in with those pride-themed ad campaigns. And there's a good reason for it. The purchasing power of the LGBTQ plus community, it surpassed $900 billion in the U.S., but with progress comes backlash. And with that backlash, companies are finding that the all-in push to embrace and profit from Pride Month is now a delicate balancing act requiring a much more precise message. Joanna Schwartz is professor of marketing at Georgia College and State University and an expert in this space. And Joanna, I do want to start off with that balancing act here. How do you go off? And let's just be clear about it. Many of these companies, yes, they may have values, they may have an ethos, but they're still out there trying to make money. How do you, I says, create that balance where you go after one community with the very well knowledge that you might offend potentially another group of your consumers? Well, that's a really great you know, question. And one of the things that gets back to is the idea that you know, these aren't new things. When companies started addressing LGBT targets, they put their toe in the water very carefully, very slowly, very methodically. There were some companies that were you know, very you know, groundbreaking in, in LGBT targeting companies like Subaru or Absolute Vodka or Apple, one of the things that we've got to keep in mind is we're not just talking about customers. 7% mm. of the people in the United States are LGBT. When you don't show your values to the people who work for you, one of the things that happens is 
you don't recruit and retain the best people. So, so this is really more than just how you broadcast yourself out to sell some stuff during one month. This is really how you live as a company. And the importance of doing that and doing that authentically can't be overstated. It's interesting. Many would remind people that Target didn't invent a market that it's trying to serve. That, that market, they're responding to demand. They're responding to trans-focused swimwear demand that is out there, ultimately, Joanna. And I'm interested in how you think who's getting it right, the balance that when on the other side, they don't want to alienate those who are rightly or wrongly, ultimately, having deep-held beliefs about gender identity and that being discussed in front of children and the like. How do you counteract what sometimes is disinformation being put across in terms of online? Well, one of the things that we're also we're, we're looking at, and especially when you think about Target, um, if we're in an environment where state after state is saying that you can't do medical transitions for people who are 18 and younger, and now you're also trying to argue, well, we shouldn't even have swimwear for these people to wear. You know, that, that really doesn't resonate as authentic. But one of the things that Target has done Target was in the forefront. If you're familiar, if you remember when North Carolina had uh, the HB2 bathroom bill, one of the things that Target did was they were in front very vocally saying, you know, we have inclusive bathrooms, we respect that. And one of the things that has happened over time is that um, for people who don't necessarily have that opinion, for people who feel that that's a problem, um, in the past, they would just walk past the Target Pride displays, and now it's become a cultural flashpoint, mm -hmm. which requires on you know the part of a firm to be agile. Also, how you represent mm -hmm. matters because for Target, um, pulling everything to the back of the store yeah. uh, well, creates the opposite of the go the intended goal for them. Yeah, one thing I'm curious about, Joanna, too, is just how times have changed in terms of the nature of marketing. I mean, you used to be able to really kind of segment off your marketing for a corporation. So, for example, a black family might see an ad on t TV that a white family would never see, for example, and, and you might find that a, a similar situation when it comes to the LGBTQ plus community. And I'm wondering if sort of the nature of what media is now has made it more complicated for some of these companies that want to sort of straddle a, a, a bunch of different lines, to be sure. It's made it harder and easier. One of the things about social media is that as a company, you can target somebody almost specifically. I can create an ad that is only shown to LGBT consumers based on the profiles that I have for them online. But I can also, you know, I want to put things out in the general market. And companies do that. They want to do that in a way that's digestible to all their audiences. Uh, no one's really talking about it now, but Coca-Cola uh, had a Super Bowl ad that was recognizing non-binary identity uh, several years ago. Mm. You know, and that was for an audience of 110 million people. So... Yeah, I think one of the things that we're seeing is you need to be careful in placement. You know, you don't want to put things out that offend uh, other aspects of your market, but there are ways to show um, both on the radar and under the radar that you support the LGBT community. One of the great examples is um, you have some someone here from GLAAD. One of the things that a lot of companies have done is yeah. shown their support by donating to causes that are really important within the community. Uh, organizations like GLAD, like HRC, like the Trevor Project. So there are some things that really stand out to people within the community that people outside the community won't ever see. Joanna Schwartz of Georgia College and State University. Of course, you helped design the first college level course in LGBTQ plus marketing. So a key focus there. Meanwhile, Coming up, more on Bloomberg Equality. We dig deeper into over 400 bills introduced by state legislatures this year affecting LGBTQ plus rights. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Equality. More than 400 bills affecting the rights of the LGBTQ plus community have been introduced in state legislatures across the U.S. since the start of this year alone. 
Caroline, that's more than double what we saw in all of last year. I mean, this is significant growth, and it's not only the fact that we're seeing it in terms of sheer number, but they're coming from a majority of states as well. Yes, certain states are owning certain areas of the focus, and you think of Texas, Tennessee really leading the charge, but just look at that growth that we're seeing, more than 400 plus, we have to put 400 plus number, because ultimately, Remain, we're seeing that the numbers keep changing on a daily basis, mm -hmm. and we're getting close to 500 by some yeah. counts. We want to welcome, of course, Rebecca Greenfield, who's really been at the forefront of our Bloomberg equality coverage here at Bloomberg. And the themes here, it seems to be a focus on trans, gender identity, right, for children in particular. Yeah, definitely the rise in anti-LGBTQ bills now is really targeting transgender people and gender identity. It's really moved away from gay marriage and marriage equality, which was a big focus mm -hmm. in the past. Um, some of the main focuses within that are health care. Mm -hmm. um, there's health care for minors, but it's also in some states they've introduced laws that are going up higher. So Oklahoma and South Carolina don't want any gender affirming health care for anyone up to mm -hmm. age 26. Some of the states are 21. So it's not just minors yeah. that they're going after. And then we're also seeing a rise in anti drag bills as well and kind of what kind of things children can see in schools. So those are right. definitely two of the biggest themes right now. I understand sort of the, the culture, cultural sort of implications underlying this, but there are questions here about the constitutionality, particularly when you talk about something like drag. Obviously, it may be targeted towards a certain subset of the LGBTQ plus community, but that also means that any random person who decides that they want to put on uh, something that's outside of their gender all of a sudden can get caught up in, in the law. Yeah, there's a lot of questions about, so we have Bills being introduced, most of those aren't going to pass, right? But the ones that do pass are facing legal challenges. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it remains to be seen what of this is legal will actually go into effect. I mean, a lot of it is political positioning, rhetoric, blustering. But that, even if those laws don't go into effect and mm -hmm. aren't constitutional in the end, they do have a very real effect on you know, people's experiences who are living in those states. There's been a rise in anti-LGBTQ violence. We've, you know, there was a shooting at Club Q last fall. It yeah. feels like a long time ago, but that was just last fall. And then, you know, this week or last week recently, you know, Target is saying that it's worried about the safety of the people who work in its stores. So these yeah. these laws do have real effects, even if, yeah, okay, they're not going to go into effect. They may get legal challenges. They may get blocked. Yeah. It's still, you still feel it in the culture. Absolutely. It certainly lays the groundwork, and it takes us really away from just rhetoric to something that's a little bit more impactful. Rebecca Greenfield, really appreciate doing some great reporting here on this topic. And we should point out that most of this year's newly introduced bills are actually focused on education and health. Health care, with many aiming to ban access to gender affirming health care for transgender youth and to regulate curriculum in public schools. Our next guest is Stacey Stevenson, the CEO of Family Equality. It's a nonprofit with the mission to work for LGBTQ plus families and those who wish to form them. I think that's a job, Stacey, that has gotten a little bit harder in this climate. Hi, thanks for having me. And it absolutely is a job that has gotten a little bit harder. You know, we talked about that with your last guest, that many of the bills that are introduced are around education, are around drag shows, are around attacking our transgender community. It's also a fight for families and the creation of families and sustaining our families, truly. And it's really made our job here at Family Quality a lot harder. Stacey, you moved from Texas. You moved to Washington. That's an economic impact that must affect certain states when they take these moves. It is. And what's interesting is that I don't think that the states realize the economic impact of people leaving from one state to the other. I moved my wife and her twin boys from Texas, we are in the Dallas area, to Washington, D.C. to find a more affirming environment. And not only is there an economic impact in terms of the state losing the, that revenue, if you will, and going to another state, and now we're presidents of that state, there's also an impact to the families. And I think about, you know, we had the privilege to leave, but let's think about the thousands of LGBTQ plus folks and families who cannot leave their states and they're frankly, are stuck there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I'm curious about here as to what options those people have. It's not even just about the money either. We've heard a lot of anecdotal stories about people that are tethered to certain states because that's where their family is. That's where their career opportunities are. That's where the schools that they like are there yet they still have to find a way to maybe operate in an environment that's going to be hostile, anti-ethical to what they're trying to pursue for their family. 
That's correct. And many people are tethered to a state. They cannot move for one reason or another. Maybe they don't want to move. And I think that's where organizations like Family Equality and my peers come in. Now's the time that we have to start building community and we have to start including resilience in our strategies because we often say at Family Equality that resilience is just as important as the legal battles that we face. And that resilience and that community building is so important. The other thing is about safety in place. So if people cannot move from one state to the other for whatever reason, what does safety in place look like? How do we give people resources, information, education on how they keep themselves and their families mm. safe? That's what we have to start putting as part of our, our strategies. Prior to family equality, you had senior roles at defense, technology, finance industries, corporate America, Stacey. What role does corporate America play? Hmm. They play a huge role. As someone who spent 20 something years in corporate America, spent time on ERGs, went through, I think some of my, my most impactful, I think coming out stories in terms of my career in, in corporate America, I understand how impactful their influence is, how employees lean on and depend on corporate America. And I will say right now, more than ever, we need a show of leadership. Right now is a time for leadership. I'm asking all corporations to look at their corporate strategy around LGBTQ plus equality, pride, et cetera, and say, are we showing up as leaders? I think a middle ground used to exist. Mm -hmm. We all talked about balance in one of the other segments. I'm not sure that balance is gonna be so easy to strike anymore. Mm -hmm. The middle ground doesn't exist anymore. It's either you believe in equality or you don't. Mm -hmm. And businesses are gonna to have to make some very tough decisions. All right, Stacey, we're going to have to leave it there. And I actually hope, actually, that your last comment ends up being wrong. Hopefully we can one day find some middle ground. Appreciate, though, the folks out there like you fighting for us. Stacey Stevenson, Family Equality. We'll be back from New York. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Equality. What an impactful way to kick off our special programming today. We've got so many more conversations to have, but almost depressing yeah. what our last guest had to say. Yeah, when Stacey Stevenson was talking about the need, the need to move your family, uproot it from one state to another to protect yourself, to protect your family, that's real impact, not only for her and her family, but really for our economy as and well. And that they saw no middle ground. No middle ground. We're going to continue this conversation all month long, every Thursday through the month of June, with a lot of other topics that also walk in the same space. I mean, I talk tech a lot, and we're going to be next week thinking about how AI, artificial intelligence, is it mm. helping, is it hindering, is it more women are being impacted from their workplace? This mm -hmm. also has an issue of bias with it. It has a potential bias, right? Does it help our society or does it drive us further apart? We appreciate you joining us today. We'll be back. This is Bloomberg.